morning Com connection point welcome to church this morning let's stand together we're going to worship the king celebrate the coming of our lord and savior jesus christ merry christmas to y'all let's sing out the joy fill this place this morning King is here indeed. That's who we worship. Let's lift our voices in the sea. Heart the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled.
today that you, in this Christmas season, that you are coming along on those lists. I believe that we have two lists that we've been working on. That's our gift list that we're preparing for for next week, but we also have a deliverance list. A, lift, a list where we want God to intervene in our lives or someone else's lives that we love to do some work in their life in this season. I know for our family alone in this past week, we've had three with the flu. We've had a friend diagnosed with cancer. And uh, a teammate of my son, his mother unexpectedly passed away. There's a lot of hurt and just heartache that we're, we're battling, but we're hanging uh, all those things on is this phrase, is in the midst of the hurt and the, hurt and the heartache, hold on to hope. Because hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And he's the one who's given us life, not only in this life here and now, but a life to come, of healing, of wholeness with him. And in this season, as we're reflecting on these realities of hurt, we also have hope. And hope can stand even brighter because of the work of Jesus on the cross, amen? Amen. So let's prepare for a time of communion together. Let's have a seat. Pull out that cup that you received on the way in. And as we take this bread together, his bread represents his body punished for us. So let's take that, remembering that work on the cross. In the cup, which represents his blood poured out, let's drink. Let's pray together. So Lord, we just thank you for the chance to gather today, to lift high your name. Lord, you've stood in the gap for us, brought, built a bridge from our hurt to hope, and given us a new life. And so we celebrate you today knowing that your finished work on the cross has given us healing, has given us wholeness, has prepared a place for us. And we know in this season as we're just in awe and wonder of who you are, we have something to hold on to in the midst of these things that we we wrestle with and sit in. So I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace today, for your mercy, for the chance that we have to live a life uh, that while it's not perfect on this earth, we have something to look forward to. And we just trust you in the season that as you work in our lives, the Lord, you are glorified and honored. And we celebrate you today. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I am so glad to see you in church this weekend. Can you believe our Christmas Eve services are less than a week away? That's right, less than a week, and we have incredible Christmas Eve services planned. So make sure that you grab some of these here invites on your way out today. Invite your friends, your neighbors, the people you love. You know, an invite truly can change a life. Let me show you a picture of my friend, John Bowersock. John started attending here because he was invited and God has met him here and transformed him. I've gotten to know John and he is truly growing in Jesus in phenomenal ways. He's serving in a number of different capacities and it is so fun to see him becoming the man of God that God designed him to be. So I wanna encourage you, who in your family, who in your workplace could you invite to sit with you at one of our Christmas Eve services. I also wanna make sure you understand what's coming up in the weeks following Christmas Eve. December 25th, Christmas Day this year, falls on a Sunday. So on that Sunday, December 25th, we're gonna worship online from our homes with an online Christmas devotional. In fact, I would encourage you, it's short, it's sweet, to have your kids watch the Christmas devotional before they open their presents. Don't worry, it's not too long. And your kids will love it. It will remind them what Christmas is all about. One week after that, January 1st, New Year's falls on a Sunday. And so our services are gonna look a little different that weekend. We'll have two services here at our Brownsburg location, one at our Avon location. Those times are listed on the screen. And then January 7th and 8th, we'll kick off our January series. So with that, please, please be praying. Who can you invite for Christmas Eve? And would you join me and the rest of the leaders here in truly praying that the Spirit of God would work in every one of those services 
promises that he would bring people to salvation and that he would restore peace and relationship with God for people who have wandered or are far from God. Well, with that in mind, God's got a great word for us today from our teaching pastor, Ron Merrill. Would you put your hands together and give Ron a huge connection point? Welcome. Well, hello, church. I uh, hope you're doing well today. And uh, just so you know, um, you don't have to do what John tells you to do. <laughs> don't put your hands together. You don't need to clap for me, for sure. Go, give me a hug, though, because it's going to get cold. I see negative something in the horizon here in the next couple of days, and so I'm going to need layers and hugs, uh, more than applause, okay? So uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, Church, we love you so much, and I hope that there's been some encouragement coming your way these last few weeks as we've been working our way through this series. God keeps his promises, and it's good, been good reminders for me. I was so blessed last week by Pastor John's message, and today I'm really hoping that you can find some encouragement. If you have ever felt misunderstood, if you ever felt overlooked, passed over, if you ever felt marginalized, and maybe you've felt in the minority somehow, maybe you felt weak, maybe you felt like the underdog, underappreciated, if you have ever felt small or forgotten, then I really believe God's got a promise for you. I really believe that God's got some encouragement for you today if you're feeling small or you're feeling forgotten. That might be a tender spot for some of you that maybe uh, your childhood kind of drilled that into you and now it doesn't take much for you to feel overlooked, underappreciated, small or forgotten. Some of you have not had to deal with that too much and yet maybe there's been something recently at work or a moment in a relationship or maybe it's uh, an opportunity that's kind of passed you by. Maybe some of you were big and renowned at one point in your life but now feel, for whatever reason, small and forgotten and that's got its own set of challenges. Can I just tell you, if that's you here today, that um, God sees you. God has not forgotten you, and he does not think that you're small. In fact, if you're feeling small or forgotten, you might actually be better soil for God to cultivate than those who find all of their worth and value and significance only in themselves, their talents, their skills, their intellect, their bank account, their number of social media followers, whatever it is. I think some of us that have had some laps feeling small or forgotten, there can be a real humility that comes with that. There can be a meekness, a lowliness that you might sense there that actually makes it better soil. Because in our culture, our culture just, anything that is out front gets all the value and the significance. Anything that's attractive, that's what gets the most value and significance. But right out of the gates here, I'd love just to pause for a moment and remind us not to confuse prominence with significance. They are two entirely different things. Prominence and significance. For example, my nose is incredibly prominent on my face. However, it is not the most significant thing about me. Even though my nose and this bald beacon is what is most prominent about me, it is not what is most significant about me. And yet our culture will say that the things that are, the people that are, the places that are the most prominent are also the most valuable, 
also the most significant. The problem is that's the way the world operates and in God's economy, it's entirely the opposite. God has a very long track record of doing some pretty significant and rather big things through some very small people and small places and even small moments. It's better soil, but we hate the small. We despise the small and we work hard to kind of make ourselves big so that we'll finally feel significant. God zeroes in though on the small and the lowly and the humble and the meek and the ones that by the world standards appear small and forgotten. God's going, uh, that's, that's actually what I'm looking for. Because what I can do in and through them, the seeds that I can plant in their life, it's not gonna get choked out by the cares of this world. It's just gonna allow me the opportunity to do some phenomenal things through them. So if you're small and forgotten today, then just be encouraged right from the get-go. His track record is phenomenal at taking something small and doing some big stuff through it. I'm, I'm not much of a botany plant tree guy. I enjoy them, I appreciate them. But this week I did a little research and what I researched was something called wisteria. Oh my goodness, it's my new favorite. I love wisteria. Okay, this what you see here is a picture of wisteria and uh, this is obviously wisteria in the winter. This is wisteria not in bloom. And so to look at this uh, branch vine of wisteria here, it's not much to look at, is it? And if you didn't really know better, you could drive by it, you could see it and think that, uh, well, wisteria is kind of lame. Wisteria doesn't have much to offer. You could look at this and go, I think that might even be dead. I'm driving around now and a lot of the trees that were so beautiful just a couple of months ago look like this. Which just as a real quick side note, remember that trees, plants, and whatnot, they don't always bear fruit 24-7, 365 days a year, do they? Sometimes the stuff that makes its way to the outside that's so visible and such a tangible blessing and even attractive only come in seasons. And yet, to look at this wisteria right now, it's not dead. In fact, there's some pretty important transformative work that's going on inside the wisteria on the inside, even though the outside doesn't really look like it. But then in a particular season, something big happens with wisteria. If you're not real familiar, this is wisteria in bloom. Take a look at that. Everybody give a good whoa. That's not photoshopped, that's not doctored. I didn't monkey with the lighting on it or whatever. This is Japanese wisteria in bloom and it is stunning. The same thing season before that looked like nothing, you could have driven right by and wouldn't do anything, you would not drive right by this and not have some sort of reaction. There is a season where wisteria blooms and the outward appearance uh, is an absolute big blessing. It's beautiful as you pass by. Here's the thing though. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse seven, we're reminded by God, God doesn't look at the same thing that man looks at. He says, mankind looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In a world that is zeroed in on the flashy and the blooming and the attractive and the prominent, God zeroed in on the heart. God is looking for those whose hearts are inclined toward him, whose hearts are just kind of soft and open and maybe feeling a little bit small or forgotten and saying, okay, I sure hope God doesn't forget me. Because it seems at times like everybody in the world has forgot, forgotten me. The beauty of it is this. 
whether you're prominent in society or not, whether you're feeling small or forgotten or not, there are seasons where that will come and go. But I can guarantee you this, even if you are one of those behind the scenes, quiet, underappreciated, overlooked, middle child, quiet, humble, whatever sorts of people, your heart can look like this full on wisteria bloom. And if people got to know you, that's what they'd see. And because God knows you because he made you, that's what he sees. You're not small, you're not forgotten. Everybody else might just not see it yet. But there's some significant things that he can do through those that are kind of meek and humble and lowly. I'd love to take a little bit of a journey through the scriptures, both Old and New Testament. We've been looking at these promises of God, some of which we've already seen come to fulfillment. We're taking a look in particular at this Christmas story, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, that was promised by God. And what we're gonna see on the macro level is that God's got this track record of, I'm gonna bring the king, King Jesus, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. It doesn't get bigger. And how's he gonna come? Through whom is he gonna come? Where is he gonna come from? He's gonna come from a really small person in a really small place. And yet something big is gonna come through a small person in a small place. You look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter seven, Old Testament prophecy about the coming Savior, about through whom the Savior is gonna come Hundreds of years before he came, Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, says, all right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so there's a promise that the Savior is going to come, and the Savior is not going to come through some position of wealth or power or influence. The woman is going to uh, give birth to Jesus is a teenager who is a virgin, who doesn't have any particular wealth or even family pedigree so much. But you know what was stunning about Mary? a wisteria blooming heart that God was aware of. You know that, that for generations, Jewish women, Jewish girls would have known the promise of a Messiah, would have known that there's a savior that's gonna come and would have been familiar many with Isaiah's promise. And generation after generation of, of young women would have grown up, probably at the very least in the back of their mind, wondering, I wonder if God will choose me. And yet we know in her lumble, humble, lowly self that, that Mary has kind of the appropriate, like, who am I? When she's confronted with the news hundreds of years after this promise, She's aware of the promise, but she has some questions about how this is gonna take place. She's got some questions about her, appropriate questions. But God takes small people and then does some big things through them. He did it on the biggest of levels with Jesus through Mary. You keep going, go to Micah, go to chapter five. In your Old Testament, another Old Testament promise, this time about where, the, the location of the birth of Jesus. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, it was promised that he was gonna come through Bethlehem, from Bethlehem, which already, if you're doing a little bit of the math with Jesus, is a problem because Jesus' family didn't live in Bethlehem, he lived in Nazareth. 
But the way that the census was divvied up, you had to go to the home of your, your earthly father, in this case was Joseph. And he was in the line of David, King David. And the city of David is called Bethlehem. And so they made the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem and in so doing then fulfill this prophecy. The promise comes to true as now they arrive and oh, here comes the baby. But hundreds of years before, Micah chapter five, verse two, talks about the location of the birth of Jesus saying, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Here's another echo, especially with regard to the gospel of how God is gonna take a small person and now a small place and do something on the grandest, biggest order that we could possibly imagine in bringing Jesus through a small location, Bethlehem. We went right near there. I went to Israel a number of years ago. We got to see Bethlehem and from a distance. It's, it's not remarkable. We were up on a hill kind of looking down into it you could drive right by it, like Crawfordsville, <laughs> like Brownsburg, like Ava. I mean, when you look, you just go, there's nothing real significant about this. This isn't super special. It's just kind of a little place. And yet through this little place, which was within the region of Judah, which was the smallest of the tribes of Israel, in Israel itself, which if you're not real familiar, is a really small country. Yeah, granted the borders have changed from biblical time to today in some way, shape, or form. Do you know how small Israel is? You think about the place that it's played in history and will continue to play in history for this tiny little place, the map there, about dead center of the map, that little orangey part there is the nation of Israel. You've got a small city, Bethlehem, in a small tribe of Judah, in a small country of Israel, and yet this is what God chooses to bring himself into the world. He could have chosen the Roman Empire. He could have fast forward to our day and age and done it right here in the United States of America. He could have done it in China. He could have done it in a number of places and yet he chose a small little city and a small little tribe and a small little country. Do you know that Israel is four times smaller than the state of Indiana, the entire country. It's some 280 or so miles from north to south. At its widest point, it's only like 85 miles across. At its white, you can get across the widest part of the whole country of Israel in an hour and a half. At its narrowest, nine or 10 miles across. And yet, this is where the promised savior is gonna come. God does these big things through small people and small places. Look at what he's doing here. What is Brownsburg? What's Avon? What, what's Indiana in the grand scheme of the United States? And yet look at what God is doing here. What, what is any of our little cities in the grand scheme of things? What about your little home? No home is too small for God to do absolute miracles of what takes place right within the walls of your living room, your kitchen. God loves to take seemingly small, seemingly insignificant people and places and moments and then just turn on the fire hose with his power and his love and his grace and do miraculous things. If we continue the journey a little bit, if you turn to Matthew, go to Matthew, go to chapter one. 
Matthew chapter one, we're now from the old end of the New Testament and we're right at the start of the historical account of Jesus. His life, his death, his resurrection in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in Matthew chapter one, it starts with the genealogy of Jesus. We get to track from Abraham on who were in the family line, who were woven into the family tree and genealogy of Jesus. And there's some that are kind of stunning in here. These are life-changing verses. I I wanna read them to you and and track with me here. Matthew chapter one, verse one. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Whoa. Isn't that life changing? (laughs) Didn't your heart just get warm? I'm just, I'm just kidding. All I can think about is, ooh, salmon sounds good. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, is this is a genealogy. Here's, here's a family line that you can actually trace. Descendants of Jesus through the line of Joseph. Now, look at verse five. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Matthew pauses for a minute on the long line of guys and gives us a woman who is woven into the family line of Jesus. And her name is Rahab. And she might be familiar to many of you. If not, you can go back and read the book of Joshua. At the beginning, you'll find the story of Rahab. And and knowing that Rahab is woven into the story of Jesus, woven into the family of Jesus, it's pretty remarkable because Rahab was not a Jewish woman. Rahab was a Gentile. Rahab was a Canaanite. And Rahab, by profession, was a prostitute. She lived in a city called Jericho, and and Jericho was set up like many fortified cities back then. They would put the wealthiest people, the most prominent people in the culture, the most significant people in the center of the city. And then they would build walls around that. And then the next ring out would be the next level of influencers, lesser so than the inner circle. And they would be less wealthy and so on and so forth. Concentric circles, walls in between, enclosed by a final wall. And on on the outer wall there is where the least of these lived. This is where the poorest of the poor lived. This is where the least significant lived. This is where Rahab lived. And by profession, she had to live out something that probably brought a lot of shame. And likelihood is her house is built into the outer wall itself. And yet in God's providence, when he sends two spies into the area, they crawl up and in to the wall there and find themselves right at Rahab's house. And she knew just enough, just enough about the character and nature of God to offer them help. And God floods through her, her her little faith in that moment, and rescues her from the coming destruction and her family. And then she gets woven in, she marries in to this lineage that eventually leads to Jesus. A Gentile Canaanite prostitute is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Don't tell me that God is not inclined toward the outsiders. 
Don't tell me that God is not for those who feel marginalized and pushed out and the least of these. Don't tell me God's not for the small and forgotten. He is pulling them in to relationship with him. He's used them historically, taken these small, overlooked, forgotten people and done phenomenal things through them. And then he continues. He continues to do it. He promises not just to do a big thing through Mary and Bethlehem by sending Jesus. He also promises to do a big thing through our weakness, through our lowly, humble, soft hearts that are just going, gosh, I I don't know if anybody else sees me, but God, I'm trusting you see me. And God kind of gets to it through Paul's writing. If you continue our journey through in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this letter to these believers in the city of Corinth. And he's trying to encourage them because Corinth in their day was actually a prominent city. It was a significant city culturally. Lots of people, lots of stuff going on. But kind of like me and you in our culture here today, the Corinthian believers were getting sucked into their prevailing culture, which just basically said, hey, if you're rich, attractive, strong, if if you're in a position of influence, then you're valuable. And so they were kind of wandering off in the pursuit of those things and were kind of losing track of God and how he operates, and I love Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians chapter one, listen to this encouragement to them, verse 26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, listen, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. It continues on. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Have you ever felt powerless or despised or like you're somewhat of a nothing. God sees you and the soil of that heart is something God's longing to get into. And what he did for these people is what he's doing for me and you here today. He takes the powerless and the despised and the nothings and he makes us somebody. He takes the powerless and the despised and the nothings and he unites us with Jesus Christ. When Jesus came for us and then died for us and then rose from the grave for us, he came willingly. He came out of love because he loves you that much and so he pursued you and me when I was nothing, when I was a sinner, when I wasn't significant at all. The God of the universe saw fit to do that for me. He saw fit to do that for you. And he came and he made you and I right with God. He made you and I pure before God, holy. He freed us from sin, my God. Goodness, what a gift. You talk about doing big, huge things through small people. I mean, I'm nothing. I am nothing at all. 
And yet God pursued me with his love and he freed me from sin. That's a big thing. He made me right before God. That's a really big thing. He made it possible for me to have a relationship with my heavenly father. That's a really, really big thing. He's united me with Christ even though I was a nothing. He made me somebody. That's true for you. Do you know God's not ashamed to be united with you? (laughs) He's not thinking you're small. He's not thinking you're forgotten over. He's never gonna forget you. He's never gonna leave you or forsake you. If you're feeling small in a sense of humble and gentle and lonely, then good. If you're smelling, feeling small like lower than a pregnant ant, then he's saying, hey, I've got news for you. I, I gotta lift you up to who you really are. It's powerful stuff that he does through these small people and small places and small moments. But it sounds kind of dumb, doesn't it? The gospel sounds dumb. If we're, I mean, I'm just being honest, like I'm not trying to be irreverent. The gospel sounds stupid at face value. Wait a minute, I don't have to do anything to earn my way into a relationship with God? It sounds stupid that I just have to receive, believe, trust, put my faith in the person and the work of Jesus, God who came, God who did the work, God who paid the price. I put my faith and trust in him, I turn my back on living independent of him, chasing my sin and just Receive the free gift of salvation offered to me by grace through faith so that no one can boast. It sounds stupid. What makes more sense is I have to earn this. I've got to work hard for this to deserve it. That makes sense because that's the way everything else operates. But it isn't how God operates. It's not how he chose to do it. He chose to take the foolish things and the humble things and the meek things to shame the wise. Because it takes us out of the center if we're not earning our way. It takes us out of the center if we're not trying and striving. It puts God at the center. It gives God the glory. And maybe that's why we don't like feeling small or forgotten. It's because we want the glory. But the glory's all his, you know? I don't, I don't deserve any glory at all because anything good that's ever come out of my mouth or my life or my heart or whatever, it's because he made it possible. That's it. Even giftedness that I have, that I have stewarded, He gave it to me in the first place. So if I'm gonna boast, it's boasting in him. And I thank God for the moments where I've felt small and forgotten because I've seen him show up in that. And he will for you too. He can do phenomenal things through big, humble, quiet lives. That's why I like our last little passage here, 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verses 11 and 12. This is such a good word. Listen, make it your goal to live a quiet life. In the Greek, that means shut up. (laughs) Minding your own business, amen, right on, woo-hoo. And working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live and you will not need to depend on others. (laughs) Go live a quiet life. In a world that's filled with people that think they're heroes or trying to be heroes or trying to be the star of the show, we could use like a real healthy dose of sidekicks today. Any Star Wars fans out there? I'm a big fan of Star Wars, and I I like Han Solo as much as the next girl, but uh, (laughs) he's the best. I mean, he's the coolest. Harrison Ford, man. I mean, Han Solo. Everybody wants to be Han Solo, but don't forget, he had a killer sidekick, Chewbacca. (laughs) Chewie, come on. 
In a lot of ways, Chewie is way better than Han Solo. I mean, look at him. I long to have a head of hair like that. <laughs> Chewie's amazing sidekick. If you're not a Star Wars guy, maybe, maybe you're a Lord of the Rings guy or girl. Everybody loves Frodo Baggins. Look how cute. He's got those baby blues just like Pastor John does. <laughs> and he did heroic stuff. Frodo did amazing things. But I'll tell you this, give, give me Samwise Gamgee any day of the week. Give me a humble friend that's willing to stay in the background, a loyal buddy that's just there for you. They're the real game changers. They're the ones that God grabs a hold of and uses like we can't possibly imagine. I love Castaway, that Tom Hanks movie, remember him in that? Not much of a hero in that one, but even he had a sidekick in that movie. It was a volleyball named Wilson. And yet, don't underestimate the power that that volleyball had in the mental health of getting Hanks off that island. Maybe today you feel a little bit like a Chewbacca or a Samwise. Maybe you even feel like the volleyball today. If you do, you're feeling small, forgotten, overlooked, underappreciated, passed over, weak, marginalized, whatever it is. If you're feeling small and forgotten, then you need to hear today God sees you, and in God's economy, you are the wisest and most significant among us. And the soil of your heart is so rich and so tender and so ready for the fantastical, giant, humongous, big work of God as he loves to take small people and places and moments, little small obediences, small faithfulnesses, small roles, small offices and thankless places where we don't get an award or applause and do his best work there. That's a promise for you. He'll take us in any state and flood through us. And so if all you ever do in your life is just pray fervently every single day for your grandkids, faithful, faithful prayer, good on you. God's gonna do big things through that. If all you ever do is serve behind the scenes in your house or at your church in an area that nobody ever sees or appreciates, God does, and the ripple effect of your service has kingdom impact. If all you ever do is just work really hard and faithfully and provide for your family and you show up and you do a good job day in and day out, that radiates your king and it'll have an impact. If all you ever do in your life is just really deeply love your kids and your spouse well, there's no songs written about you or movies written about you or books written about you. I guarantee that if you're any of those just faithful in the small and forgotten moments, someday you're gonna get to heaven. And you're gonna see the full on wisteria bloom of everything that you did in small forgotten moments that God used and fanned into flame in ways that you didn't catch or maybe any, anybody else did, but he did. You'll never be small or forgotten in his hands. He's got big things now and big things for eternity. I hope you find encouragement in that. And so gracious heavenly father, we thank you for doing a big thing and sending Jesus to an unlikely set of earthly parents and unlikely location
We thank you that you continue that pattern of doing these unexpected, big, grand, miraculous things through small moments that we've got, through people who feel seemingly insignificant that you don't and you, you just dive in and are able to use them sometimes better than anybody else. Forgive me times, Lord, where my eyes zero in on the prominent and the attractive and the glossy and the flashy and miss how you really operate. I pray for those that are feeling small and forgotten that you'd encourage them today with what you have been doing that they just haven't been aware of, what you are doing, what you continue to do through them. We don't do what we do, Lord, because of applause or reward. We're grateful and thankful that you're the only hero of the story. We're happy to play sidekick to you. We wanna give you all the glory for anything that's going on in our heart and our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we thank Ron this morning? Praise God for that message. And you know, as we're preparing for Christmas this next week, you know, I'm anticipating God to move in major ways. There's no insignificant role for Christmas, whether you're inviting someone to Christmas or serving this Christmas, it's going to make an impact on someone's life. And so let's be praying for our services on December 23rd at three, five, and seven, on December 24th at 11, one, three, and five. Let's be praying that hearts will be changed, that lives will be transformed here in Brownsburg and in Avon. And let's just be doing that together this next week. We'll see you back here for Christmas at Connection Point next week. Have a great day.